DNA, the Metaverse Dual Chain Network Architecture. Hi, I'm Alex Lightman. This is the Lightman Report. And today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, payments, the past, present, and future of payments. So we've gone through big changes in the evolution of humanity, starting in ancient Egypt with the first paper money used by traders, cash, and ancient times transactions, whether by consumer to consumer or consumer to business, were face to face, bartering physical goods and cash has withstood the test of time and is the number one person-to-person, peer-to-peer instrument. In the first century BC, we had the first checks used by the Romans. And so they've been around for two millennia and they've been, uh, they've been used quite a lot for P2P transactions in the last 100 years. And most of the 20th century checks were used by the wealthy. And in 1980s, checks scaled to become an important peer-to-peer tool. And check usage peaked in the 1990s uh, at about 2.7 billion different check transactions. And cards, we had the first charge card introduced in 1914 by Western Union. And it's only been since the 50s that payment cards have been considered an acceptable payment tool. Cards have never been a significant peer-to-peer uh, payment tool, primarily due to recipient acceptance challenges, unless it's a person to business. And new uh, P2P innovations are bridging the card acceptance gap and the volume of P2P transactions are on the rise. We had the first electronic movement of money, it was via telegraph, in 1918. Digitization increased the size of the transaction and the speed of money flow of each transaction. And growth in online commerce has been a driver of online payment innovation and of P2P money transfers. So actually electronic money movement has been had its hundredth anniversary, its century, and we missed it. We didn't celebrate it. We should have. And PayPal has led to the online P2P innovation. And it was that 150 million from PayPal that invested, 110 million invested in Tesla and 40 million in SpaceX has led to Elon Musk being worth $48 billion. And M payments, we had the first M mobile payment offered by SMS in Finland uh, to vending machines in 1997. So that's a 23 year old technology. And early innovation in mobile has come from developing nations where the majority of the people are unbanked. There's a big connection between the unbanked, and as we'll see, that's 2 billion adults. 31% of all adults are unbanked, and uh, mobile phones and mobile money. So companies, uh, or projects rather, like M-Pesa, which is a part of the company, Safaricom, have facilitated P2P money movement via stored value credit. And recently, uh, banks and technology companies have been investing in P2P propositions that drive mobile as the instrument of choice over the coming years. So. Going back to the past, we went from bartering and livestock to the first coins. Bartering bartering was an advantageous way to exchange goods and services for people many years ago because it enabled both parties to get what they needed. For example, two parties might exchange tools for services to fulfill the needs of both people. And livestock was also considered wealth that people could amass. The more cows or sheep someone owned, the wealthier they were. Ancient civilizations used to use beads and shells as coins. Eventually, they used precious metals to make coins more durable. And people in ancient civilizations of of Lydia were among the first to use coins made of gold and silver. This currency was both valuable and portable. So we had uh, bartering in prehistory. Early man would barter their goods and service they had for the ones they lacked. 1200 BC, they had cowrie shells. Kauri shells was the dominant form of money in Asia. China was the first to use them, big innovation there. And uh, about 1000 to 700 BC, we had metal coins. Uh, Coins made from base metal first appeared in China, 1000 to 600 BC, and gold coins were first used in Lydia. So we have China actually with the first to use shells, the first to use metal coins, and uh, one of the first to use paper money, pretty impressive. So the past, benefits of money against barter. The value can be retained even if partially rather than complete decay. And there's an ease of transfer of value and to defer value. Durability, you can withstand repeated use. You have that with coins, 
paper, gold. Portability, you can carry it around. Divisibility, fractional units. Uniformity, versions of the same currency have identical value. Limited supply, unlimited supply equals zero value. And that's the big innovation of cryptocurrency to solve the double spend problem, to solve the problem of unlimited supply leading to hyperinflation, leading to collapse. And then acceptability. This is legal tender for all debts, public and private, written on the currency. And stability. If it's unstable, people will look for alternatives. And so we have the, in 600 BC, the first official currency was uh, minted by King Aliates of Lydia in modern, where Turkey is today. And we also had in 1290 AD, the travels of Marco Polo to China introduced the paper of the idea of paper money to Europeans. In 1250 AD, the florin, the gold coin minted in Florent, was widely accepted, encouraging international commerce. And you had the, uh, in 1661, paper money didn't catch on for quite a while because you didn't have the first banknotes being printed until, uh, uh, well, you know, basically uh, 400 years approximately from the time that Marco Polo came back again. And you, in 1860, you had industrial giants like Western Union you know, spearheading e-money with electronic funds transfer. Uh, and then in 1946, John Biggins invented the charge it card, the first credit card. So if you look at the show, one of the greatest shows in the history of television was Silicon Valley by Mike Judge. And Aristotle's sound money is cited in the Silicon Valley episode on the Pied Piper coin when they were getting into crypto. So the pr uh, properties of sound money are durability, Physically stable, does not rot or rust or melt. Transferable, easy to transfer ownership from one person to another. Divisible, can be subdivided into smaller units of money. Scarce, limited quantity available for use. Recognizable, easy to recognize and verify authenticity. And fungible, one unit of money can be substituted for another. Present, that digitization of payments and money transfers. So we've gone from the past, now we're coming to the present. Internet banking is spread across the U.S. in the 1990s. Pay by touch, 2002. Bitcoin is the first digital money that solved the double spend problem. Starting in uh, January 3rd, 2009, the white paper came out Halloween 2008. Last five years, banks started closing their office and transferred to remote banking. Look up the books by Brett King. Uh, he's the, my co-author, or I'm his co-author, of the book Augmented Life in the Smart Lane. Brett has written books, Bank 3.0, Bank 4.0, uh, best business book of the year, according to some people, uh, Branch Today, Gone Tomorrow, uh, books about this whole phenomenon, if you want to dive into it. And Apple Pay was launched in 2014. Smart payments started to be available. Google Pay 2015, Samsung Pay 2015. And we have a lot of news about cash. So one of the main disadvantages of paper cash is that it can transfer viruses, including the dreaded coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, and hence digital payments and crypto are healthier alternatives. So in Russia, Russians were urged to reject cash to slow the coronavirus spread, and there are many, many headlines saying we're going to decline that. Yes, there probably is some level of people who want to control electronic money behind this, but it's also factual. In the future, private money, to be or not to be, or B2B, corporations are trying to create their own payment ecosystems. The future was bright until it wasn't. And as we've seen in a previous Lightman report on the challenges of digital assets, the government stopped the launch of Libra, Facebook, and of Gram from the, uh, basically ton, uh, from the Telegram network. And corporations will continue to entertain the idea of issuing private money to facilitate payments and more, especially in the time of global crisis. And the Chinese government has launched a pilot project for the digital yuan. And since there are 150,000 companies that are majority owned or substantially owned or controlled by the Chinese government, they can create an ecosystem overnight for the digital yuan like that. And the first companies using it are include McDonald's and Starbucks. So the COVID-19 crisis is the crisis of global order and conflicts between the U.S. and China might end up dividing the world in separate economic zones. So you might have one part of Asia that's all digital yuan based, another that's all dollar based. And it's possible that the fight between the digital yuan and the digital dollar will be part of the confrontation between the U.S. and China for economic supremacy during the, 19, the, the 2020 to 2030 period. 
And then we're getting to something I really love to talk about, which is the smartphone as the main payment system. So we spend our hours of our free time on our 4 billion smartphones and mobile banking already is available for billions of people. E-commerce is evolving into m-commerce. That was the very first Lightman report, how that was working, how you were having physical world retail go to e-commerce and m-commerce. And banking and merchants, as we know them, might go extinct and be replaced by smartphone apps. So let's dive into some of these stats here. The global value of payment technologies market uh, is about uh, just around $3 trillion with an annual growth rate of just around 38%. In the top five countries with mobile wallet usage, these are the smart countries, China with 47%, Norway with 42%, the UK with 24%, Japan with 20%, Australia 19%. America, come on, everyone should be using mobile wallets. And you have four types of payment technology, near field communication, sound wave based, secure magnetic transmission, and QR code. Mobile spending by segment. By far the largest percentage of it, about 69% is money transfers. And then 23% is for merchandise purchases. For bill payments, 5.1%. For ticketing, about 1%. And everything else is less than 2%. So it's all about the money transfers. And worldwide users per mobile wallet, by far the greatest number are using WeChat Pay, 600 million. Alipay, 400 million. So of the top payment system, China has a billion people out of out of uh, 8 billion people using their mobile wallets. That's incredible. What a, they're, they're way ahead of everybody else. PayPal, 210 million. Uh, Apple Pay, 87 million. I'm surprised. I thought it would be more. Uh, Samsung Pay, 34 million. Amazon Pay, 33 million. Now, Amazon has about 300 million regular customers, so that's only about 10% of their customers. I think that you'll see some of the fastest growth there. And then you have the future of mobile payments. You will get rid of physical cards. You'll have wearables. I just got my Fitbit uh, working since, uh, since last night. We can switch the camera to me there. See, that's my new Fitbit. And uh, then, okay, and then also biometric technology. And this Fitbit has all kinds of biometrics and it has payment. So both of those are integrated in together. Now, there are 12 disruptive technologies that are going to impact payments in a big way. And this has been around for a while. This was created in 2013 by Daniel Tay in Singapore. And uh, McKinsey and company put it out there. So renewable energy, people will want to have crypto to get payments from individual solar panels and advanced oil and gas exploration and recovery, advanced materials, 3D printing, energy storage, next generation genomics, autonomous and near autonomous vehicles will use payments. So you'll have Ubers that have no driver where the, the vehicle will be going out and trying to pick up passengers and earn more money and then trade that money to be charged up in electricity portals that are all around. Advanced robotics, cloud technology, the internet of thing, automation of knowledge work and the mobile internet. All these things will impact payments in a big way because it's not just people, but it's also machines that will be using that. There's a, something called the Dictionary of the Future, and it quotes me with the, the term, or credits me with the term Internet Iceberg Effect, and that what you see in the Internet, where it's human to human, that's just the tip of the iceberg because 90% of what's happening in the Internet is machine to machine, not person to person. And the future of payments, we're going to have less cash. So cash is basically falling below 40%, uh, killing the credit card through uh, near field communication, getting a single number that you can switch around uh, at less store based payments and wallets become virtual uh, and pin numbers are you don't have to use them for transactions. Uh, they're less and less used and no currency borders. And I'm going to read this one. Bitcoin and other virtual currencies offer instant, cheap, and secure ways to pay and have gained traction despite concerns surrounding illegal activity and tax avoidance. Some economists foresee them being used as tools to help stimulate, uh, complement, and entirely replace existing border-based currencies. Uh, and in the future, we have KYC and regulations. Today, every financial provider operates in a single jurisdiction that has its own regulation and own know-your-customer policy. These issues need a complex regulatory approach by governments and international organizations. 
Regulators can create a common database for KYC and open access to financial providers. And in this situation, uh, the sponsors of this program, Metaverse and DNA Chain, can be useful for KYC standards for the financial industry. So let's talk about crypto payments for the unbanked and for the banked. Two billion adults don't have bank accounts. That's 31% of all adults. Cryptocurrency could change their lives because many of these people do have mobile phones. Large uh, numbers of the unbanked live in developing nations where their capital is unprotective, and they often live in under oppressive regimes that manipulate local currencies through taxation, inflation, theft, and so on. Crypto is the only truly global currency, free from any one entity's influence. Without complex banking corrupt uh, bureaucracies, cryptocurrencies give the unbanked the chance to securely save and transfer money, access credit, and even make international transfers. Have you read about what's happening in Venezuela? And uh, I'll just tell you one thing. The salary in Venezuela, if you translate it from boulevards, is about $6 a month. You know how much it costs in Venezuela for a hamburger or a hot dog? $2. So this is, a, this is where a lot of people have maintained their buying power in the face of the collapse of the buying power of their salaries. And then the implications of crypto for the bank as public distrust of our financial institution increases, so does the demand for a more open, transparent credit system. And banks exploit us by charging deposit and withdrawal fees, foreign transaction fees, lost card fees, membership and service fees, overdraft fees. By the way, there are people who have sent hundreds of millions of dollars in crypto for less than the cost of, a, of an overdraft. Does that make any sense? Uh, ATM fees, account closing fees, and many more. And cryptocurrency, in theory, has no middlemen to charge transaction tolls. Say you need cash to get across the border. Who would you trust your local to uh, teller to deliver it in a few business days, working banker's hours? Or would you trust the most secure and sophisticated digital distribution highway ever created? There's never been a cheaper and faster channel to send and receive funds than crypto. There's big implications for crypto payments for e-commerce and m-commerce. Today's online payment infrastructure allows mega corporations to collect data on our purchases, but you don't have to give them that. All transactions on the blockchain are snarky and therefore pseudonymous. Uh, uh, and decentralized apps will be unable to monitor user activity other than basic non-identifying metrics to keep their system stable. Users will be able to verify the validity of a transaction on their own without being serfs of big techs or their banks. So last slide, the future of AI enabled payments is coming. So right now, 25% of transactions are manually reviewed. Uh, there are 726 uh, global payment processing this year. You'll have 726 transactions, 726 billion transactions. And there are six use cases for AI enabled payments. AI-based chatbots that interact with customers, answering questions or directing them. Improved fraud detection. The AI can analyze data to look for unexpected commonalities between fraudulent and non-fraudulent transactions. Biometric payments. AI systems can use facial and voice recognition to enable payments without needing a card. AI-based credit scores. AI offers lenders the ability to get a hyper-personalized look at someone's credit worthiness and score them more accurately. You can have AI and debit cards that can help consumers reduce student loans or credit card debt and make better spending and savings. Uh, Brett King has a company called Movin that actually gives you feedback on the, your payments uh, and how that works. And digital payment wallets. AI and a collaboration of digital payment wallets with other online services like messengers helps users make peer-to-peer -peer payments via Facebook Messenger or Slack or other things. So that's our Lightman report this week on the past, present, and future of payments. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope that as you make transactions that you'll uh, save more money and you'll be able to do more things based on what you might have learned here. Thank you for your time, and I hope to see you again in a future uh, Lightman report.